Okay, we're about to begin. You guys uh, let me know when you're good. What's up? Oh yeah, uh, do you want to put it up here? Yep, that's okay. You know, you let me know when. Okay, good morning everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, as you all know, today's uh, will be a tech briefing followed by a news conference beyond the findings of a study conducted by Help Seeker Technologies. Uh, what's going to be going around right now is uh, an embargoed report. There are three documents. Um, whoever would like one can have one. Go ahead, Fraser. Um, again, this is embargoed information. We ask that nothing be reported on, tweeted on, photographs, etc., until after 11 a.m. And the same goes for any of the video that's going on here. We will have uh, our team monitoring social media, and if we do see anything, unfortunately, we'll have to ask uh, you to leave. Uh, so again, it's embargoed, and please respect that. Um, speaking today, we will have Dr. Alina Turner. She's the co-president and co-founder of Help Seeker Technologies. We will also have uh, our staff sergeant, Eugene Lum, from Vancouver Police um, Operation Command. Uh, they will be speaking during the technical briefing. Um, also, a part of the technical briefing and that will be here to, to answer any questions is Jesse Donaldson. He's the executive, sorry, she's the executive vice president, growth, help seeker technologies. And we have Camilo S. Camila, uh, research and policy analysis for help seeker technologies. We'll also have Simon Demiris. He's the director of VPD uh, planning, research, and audit section. They, those three will be here to answer uh, any questions um, after the tech briefing. We will have Dr. Alina Turner and Staff Sergeant Eugene Lum speak. We ask that you hold the questions for them until after the tech briefing. We'll have a little, uh, once 11 hits, we'll have a little break, and then we'll begin with our, our news conference. And again, if you have any questions or you want sound bites or certain clips, you're welcome to ask questions uh, during then as well. Uh, again, and I just want to reiterate and harp on that this is embargoed information until after 11, so we do ask that you respect all that. Okay, so we'll get right into it. I'm going to ask um, Staff Sergeant Eugene Lum, uh, Vancouver Police Operational Command, to come up and, and begin. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Eugene Lum. I'm a Staff Sergeant uh, in the Operations Division. And we're here to, today to talk about two reports. Um, one of which has been uh, put out in the media. Uh, the first report is a Help Seekers Technology Report. It's called the Social Impact Audit. Um, and we're gonna have Dr. Alina Turner speak to that report in just a minute. The second report is a VPD report and it's entitled Rebuilding the Broken. Uh, the VPD report is based off of some information, data and speaking points in the Help Seekers report. So I will turn it over at this time to uh, Dr. Turner to talk about the Help Seeker Social Impact Audit. Good morning, everybody. I'm just waiting for my slides to come up, so thank you so much uh, for having me. I'm honored uh, to be on this land. I'm uh, respectfully acknowledging uh, the traditional and ceded Coast Salish Territory, uh, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Uh, so thank you very much for welcoming me here today. Uh, our team at Help Seeker is across uh, this beautiful country, so uh, we're always honored to, to be supporting communities, um, including Vancouver's. So a little bit about us. We are a social impact technology B Corp, or B Corporation. We uh, build solutions that empower leaders on the front lines of solving the world's most complex social challenges through data, software, and insights. And uh, if you're curious, you can find out more about us and our work across Canada at helpseeker.org. Um, so let's go to the next one. Uh, purpose of this project. So when the Vancouver uh, Police Department reached out to us, uh, we had been deeply um, enmeshed in uh, analysis on data 
uh, that showed us that across the country, social challenges were uh, accelerating, and this was during the time of COVID as well. One of the things that uh, we saw is that it, the increasing fault lines of the social safety net were emerging at, uh, at faster rates and, and, and with deeper complexity. And it was impacting uh, individuals and families in, in novel ways or in, in deeper uh, felt ways as well. So with that, uh, one of the types of analysis that we take on is to understand what the supply of the social safety net looks like in a community. And why we need to understand supply is pretty obvious. Uh, you need to know what you have, uh, you need to know what you need, and then you need to figure out how to calibrate the two, how to uh, find the gaps, and how to uh, build a path forward that's based on the available data. And so uh, with that, uh, the collaboration between us and VPD started to dig into uh, what the social safety net looked like in, in Vancouver so that we could start that analysis of supply. All right, next slide. So defining the social safety net. This is a, um, an interesting question that uh, academics are, have and continue to be uh, debating. How do we define a social safety net? Um, the social safety net of Canada is actually quite complex. Uh, and if anybody has ever tried to navigate it, you'll, uh, you'll uh, agree uh, very likely with the statement as well. Um, in different uh, analyses comparing Canada to other countries, a majority of that analysis draws on financial benefits to individuals. So it, it will include things like you know, pensions, social assistance, um, benefits that go to for those that are experiencing unemployment. That's how Canada tends to get analyzed in the OECD um, nations to see how we fare compared to other countries. Nordic countries is, is a good example of, of those types of comparisons. But what's missing and only looking at those benefits is that we're not seeing how the actual service delivery components come into play there. So uh, that's where we need to dig into, you know, how do flows of funds come through uh, various uh, programs, uh, different nonprofit or charitable organizations, public services to actually deliver the social safety net in practice. So it's not good enough to only look at direct benefits. We also need to look at organizations and their delivery mechanisms to understand this. So that's the, the bullets there about uh, social infrastructure uh, needing to be uh, a much more comprehensive than, than payments. So that's where the complexity of the work comes in because data on the social safety net there's no one awesome data set that researchers can tap into, and, and believe me, I've tried uh, for the last 20 years working in this sector uh, to un understand exactly where, um, where this funding is, is coming from and where it's going. But we, luckily, we do have some data, right? So uh, here's what we do know. Um, I think that's the next slide. All right. Okay, let's get into the next one. Never mind, I was like, and here's the reveal. But actually, <laughs> there's, there's another rationale here. Why focus on social safety nets? So um, the social safety nets of Canadians, this is like one of our hallmarks um, of our democracy, right? It's, it's what makes Canada the best country in the world. Is when, we, when we're really proud of our, um, of our country, we talk about how we take care of our most vulnerable, how we build uh, the social infrastructure where our communities can thrive. So. Uh, to do that, um, of course, we have to invest in that social infrastructure. So this is, a, this is by no means a, uh, a critique of, uh, of taking, taking away from the social safety net. It's something to be proud of, um, but it's also something that we need to calibrate. As new challenges emerge, we have to uh, right size and right mix how those expenditures are allocated and to figure out are we spending too much in one area and not enough in another, we need to calibrate that. The other challenge that we have in Canada, and uh, we can trace this back to um, our colonial roots, is that we've borrowed a lot of um, the practices um, around um, devolving responsibility for the social safety net uh, from uh, public services into um, private, nonprofit, charitable, civil society organizations. Now that's an, uh, that's an amazing, and uh, effective component because it brings us nimbleness and flexibility. But on the other side, it makes our social safety net really, really complex. So 
we've estimated that there's about 100,000 different entities that are operating simultaneously in the social safety net. So you've, you've probably experienced this as well, um, trying to understand, well, how is this organization's services different than this other organization? And the truth is, if you've ever tried to navigate it from a lived experience perspective, you always hear that um, it's so complex and it's so difficult to navigate. That is also a part of this challenge of understanding the overlapping uh, components and then the gaps, right? So if you don't have a good sense of what's out there, then how can you make it more effective? Um, so with that layering, we've also got these, these accelerating social challenges as well that I mentioned before, these worsening systemic inequities that we need to deal with as well. So this suggests that there's work to be done on optimizing our social safety net. And this should be a, a question we are all asking. Um, are we getting the collective value um, out of our investments and our efforts? It's not about one entity, it's about all, um, the entire uh, ecosystem of supports. Next slide. Okay, so what leads to de-optimization? Uh, we've done work across this country, uh, like I mentioned before, everything from northern rural communities and remote communities, indigenous uh, First Nations communities, um, large, small, medium, all types of cities. And the themes are pretty consistent, right? There's different flavors, local flavors, so I don't want to take away from, from that, but the optimization is, is the theme that emerges and it applies to Vancouver um, analysis as well. So we've got overlapping and uncoordinated funding. And uh, by all means, if, uh, if somebody has this magic data set where all the funding that's coming in is, is there, I would, I would love that. Uh, we haven't found such a data set. The data set comes from all over the place and we, tr we have to try to, to uh, make sense of it. Um, there's also a lack of coordination across systems, right? So there might be pockets of service coordination that is, are trying to um, get us better outcomes. But as a cross-systems initiative, we have huge, huge challenges there on coordinating impact. That's, not, that's nothing new. This is not gonna be an, your new story, right? This is all um, theme that uh, many, many before me have also highlighted. We've also got uh, this un undeniable duplication, yet massive gaps. Um, tension. So on the one hand, we don't have enough of, of this gaping uh, resource, uh, let's say detox, treatment, uh, recovery supports, mental health supports, yet you know, we've got an overabundance of other resources that are underutilized. And we don't know which is which, and we don't have a mechanism to right size and right mix and optimize that in that entire infrastructure as a whole. We've got ineffective referrals. Right, we've uh, done many, many analyses on this, and again, it's not, uh, it's not help seekers uh, thunder to steal, but there's m much research on the inefficiency of the referral networks that we have, where uh, end users have to go to five, six, seven different spots to finally find what they're looking for, and even when they do find it, there's a long wait list in that part of the ecosystem. Yet, you know, another peer um, on the other side of, of uh, of the street might have zero wait lists and nobody knows, right? Nobody knows that that's the case. These are systemic issues, right? These are across the country and it's, it's no uh, different in Vancouver. Structural racism and discrimination, any data set that you pull will reaffirm this. Um, I know there's been so much call for disaggregated data. This disaggregated data needs to be applied to these <coughs> numbers as well. We didn't have the ability to mine for uh, the flows of funding into indigenous-led organizations. We know that reconciliation calls for uh, indigenous people to have sovereignty over their, uh, the funding and supports that are being provided to their members, but we don't have a mechanism right now to even analyze where these flows of funds are, are going and to what extent indigenous people have sovereignty over that investment. That's important and that will challenge some of these structural um, racist um, systems if we start to disaggregate the data further. Uh, high barrier systems and uh, service policies. So we, we uh, again, I'm, it's not about pointing fingers. These are systemic Canadian problems. We have challenges where um, s the only shelter in town has uh, a list of 200 people that are barred from that service and we're heading into minus 40, right? So we have these challenges of, of high barrier 
services that sometimes are the only option in for some members. And uh, unfortunately, and I'll, and I'll say this as a former service provider and as a funder, is we have poor transparency around outcomes. We might have good outcomes at a program level, but as a system, as an ecosystem, can we say how all of these services, how the 100,000 organizations roll up into impact? And unfortunately, we, we don't have that uh, line of sight currently. That's also important. So that inconsistency is a challenge. You have one um, organization that might be audited every year where all their financials is out and uh, ready for scrutiny, and that's so important, right, to democracy and, and to getting our investments, uh, um, the public eye on our investments. That's what keeps, keeps everybody um, on their toes and keeps us accountable to the public because ultimately these are public funds. These are taxpayer funds. These are um, philanthropy funds. So these, these are our collective resources. But that accountability is not consistent, unfortunately. And that's some of the, some of the critique you're, you're probably going to hear about this is, well, why, why is this data here and not that data? Well, I, I would love this data, right? Every researcher um, obsesses about a complete data set. The truth is we don't have a complete data set. What we have is bits and parts, and then we try to bring them together and start making sense of them so that we can start the dialogue, right? The important part is that we start this conversation, okay? Because when we start the conversation, new data sets can be found, uh, new analysis can be brought in, but that is gonna take the entire community to look at, look at this issue and look at these numbers. And no one organization can figure this out on their own, and Help Seeker definitely is not, is not the be all end all on, on this work. We need everybody to, to chip in, the academics, the researchers, the frontline providers, the end users as well. So, point being there, the optimization will continue to worsen with this increasing complexity of social needs, the low morale that we see in frontline delivery, and that's a, a cross-systems challenge. So, I mean, just ask a teacher, a nurse, um, how, they, how they feel about the effectiveness of, um, of our support networks right now. Uh, an expected recession, I guess we wrote this before it was formally uh, announced that we're, we're heading into this uh, economic situation. And this increased uh, media and pu public scrutiny on social issues, I mean, you're all here. Um, three years ago, when we would release these reports, and nobody cared, right? No, it was not a media story. Uh, so there, there are absolutely other reports uh, in other communities that just, you know, uh, the numbers are there and, uh, and it didn't cause this, this type of interest. And I'm encouraged by that because that, that tells me that Canadians are, are ready to have this conversation. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so understanding social impact audits um, with all the caveats that come with them. So in the ideal world, um, we would have this magical data set where we understood every organization, um, every public uh, sector department, every ministry, and how the funds flow, and we, can tr we could trace that money to an end user, to a client, and then we could trace that client's experience with that service and the outcomes they get, and then we would be able to look at that as a whole. That would be you know, the dream social impact audit. Of course, that's not the reality of what we have, right? So what we have is these partial data sets. So we have to start somewhere though, right? Because we can't wait for this perfect data set to emerge. We have to start working with what we have and we need to start digging in and uh, prompting these questions so that new data comes to light as well. So uh, for us, uh, when we develop this work, uh, our first, uh, our first, first, first baseline um, analysis looked at, let's just take a look at what's available publicly. What's out there, right? And what can we get our hands on? I mean, being a, a small startup tech company, uh, we're gonna need to uh, use the resources that are already available out there. We're gonna need to leverage open data. Um, we're gonna need to leverage public data. And lucky for us, there are um, governments and departments that are starting to make this data available, which is fantastic. Not all, um, but some. Uh, the challenge with these data sets too is that they're, like I said, they're partial. So they don't go as deep as we would like them to. Um, so every critique you have, we probably have as well of the data sets. But uh, it's a place to start. 
So with the public data that we collect, and I have a list of all of the ones we were able to locate, we start to, to dig into them as much as we can and say, okay, well, how can we make sense of this data? Is this actually doing social uh, community well-being work? Is this doing work in the alleviation of poverty? Is this doing work in mental health and addictions? Um, is this doing work in the safety realm, right? Because we're, we're looking at the social safety net. So that includes uh, social infrastructure as well as uh, safety components. So crime prevention, uh, programs that are supporting folks that are reintegrating uh, upon exit from, from prison or, or uh, jail. So we're looking at this as holistically as we can because that's the purpose of the social safety net. It's not just for one target group, it's for all of us. Um, and then we start to analyze deeper to, to understand what might be missing for a particular group. So it's a first step. Um, it's a, it's, I, don't, I wanna say it's unfortunate that it was leaked before we could do the next step, but we gotta, it was, you know, it's all good, it's all good. Um, but the next step is to do the work with the community partners to actually uh, look at uh, their perspective on their classification within it too. So um, there's, there's some uh, work in their report that references this um, additional phase of work. Uh, hopefully we can still get to do that piece, um, but it gives you a bit of a starting point on who might these organizations be that we need to do that deeper work with. So the public data sets are a great, great place to start to that end. All right, let's see, next one, okay. Limitations, if, uh, if you didn't uh, pick that uh, thread up. We can't analyze a bunch of really, really, really important um, themes from the data that we have. As much as we would, we would love for us to be able to respond to these uh, requests currently. So one, performance and impact. The public data sets don't give us, you know, out of all these thousands of organizations, we don't have a data set that says, Here's the number of clients, unique clients, right? Because clients are uh, moving across organizations. So we don't know how many unique clients are using services in the social safety net, and we don't know what outcomes they're experiencing as a whole. We, now, each organization might have a little bit of data about that client, but I'm talking about the ecosystem, right? The social safety net ecosystem, we don't understand. Uh, there's a bunch of good reasons for that as well around privacy. Uh, but if you're asking for um, my take on the performance and impact, I don't, I don't have that answer for you. All I have is, is what's, what we know from the public data. We don't know the quality of service delivery. We don't know that because we uh, obviously don't have the client's perspective on the quality of service that uh, they've experienced with these supports as well. Uh, we don't know sp specific service gaps and duplication. So if you're gonna say, um, do we have enough detox, right? Or do we have enough treatment facilities? Do we have enough emergency shelter beds? That's really important work. Um, we it's just out of scope for this analysis, right? And the user experience and access to support, I, I, I referenced that as well. So uh, a couple of other cautions as well as you read through. Uh, take caution when it speaks to financial allocations to a particular issue area. So let's say homelessness or a geographic area of na or neighborhood. So the financial data that's available only tells us about the financial flows, right? We don't know anything about the client flows. And it doesn't provide insight into the relative impact of that organization program or system compared to its revenues. So uh, that's an important one too. If you're, you've got a system that might be, or an entity that might have a budget of $100 million and one that has a budget of $100,000, but their end user uh, relative to revenue um, shows us that the one that's, um, that's the $100,000 organization has way better outcomes. I'd love to be able to do that analysis. We don't have that uh, data currently. All we, all we know is that there's organizations and they're receiving uh, funds and they're serving or they're declaring to the Canada Revenue Agency that they're serving a particular uh, theme or target population as a whole. Uh, the other piece that it d we can't account for is we don't know, uh, again, because we don't know where the clients come and go, uh, we don't know that just because an organization reports to Canada Revenue Agency that their address is in a particular geographic location, we don't know if their um, clients are coming from um, all over 
a, a broader geographic reason, and vice versa. We don't know if an organization that's outside of the boundary of analysis, so let's say the city of Vancouver, we don't know if there's any organizations in the metro van region, uh, vice versa, that uh, receive and service clients with, from Vancouver that uh, move back and forth. Right? So that's, a, that's another limitation of, of the data. It doesn't give us service catchment information. So, uh, with all of these caveats, and they're, they're s all over the report, so I'm not going to um, belabor them further because you can read them um, at your leisure. Uh, with that all in mind, there's still things that we can discern. Next slide. Okay. So, a little bit about the financial analysis in Vancouver. Like I said, you've got access to the, to the full uh, report. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here's the data sets that we were able to uh, get our hands on for this analysis. So um, the best and biggest, and, uh, and really thank you, uh, thank you Canada Revenue Agency. I don't, I don't know how many, um, how many times we've used this data set in the last couple years, but it's a, it's a really, really important data set that CRA has made available to Canadians. And, uh, um, I actually encourage everyone that's interested to take a look at the CRA's website um, because it's, it's available to anyone um, out there that's interested in, in doing this type of analysis as well. Uh, because you guys might see something that we might not see as well, so we need more, uh, more people using this data and analyzing it further. So that CRA data set on um, registered charities is a really, really important one for us. Uh, the next one is the Government of Canada's Proactive Disclosure Grants and Contributions. So we've got uh, grants that come directly from the federal government and they go into a community directly. There's a data set that uh, gives us access to how much the federal government granted to organizations. We can take that into account as well. Um, we've got the City of Vancouver budget. Uh, now, it's, it's limited to what's publicly available, like I said, so um, we definitely... Uh, can get more detail on the specific programs and clients served uh, if, we, if we choose to go deeper into this as well. Uh, but that's another data source. Uh, the same as the feds, the BC government has a grants database as well that we were able to um, bring into this. Uh, there's some BC budget estimates, so information on uh, proposed spending, um, and they do give some categorization so we can see uh, from which ministry um, what's being allocated out. Um, again, not as deep as we would like it to be, but it's a, again, we try to find as much as we can. Vancouver Coastal Health Authority, uh, financial statement. Vancouver Coastal Health, as you guys know uh, very well, is not just the uh, city of Vancouver proper, so um, it wasn't as, um, we weren't able to dig into the specific catchment area, so some of, some of their data wasn't, um, didn't lend itself to that really local analysis, but we know uh, we did capture it in their report as well. Uh, VPD, of course, because we're looking at uh, well-being and safety. Uh, Canadian Institute for Health Information, CAIHI uh, for short. This is another great data set that um, we can get some estimates around mental health and addiction spending that we wouldn't have caught in the CRA data as well. Um, so that's a, another, another really important one. And Statistics Canada, because uh, uh, back to the social safety net point around uh, comparisons of Canada to the rest of the world, majority of, uh, of social safety net analyses really look at this um, government transfers only. And so imagine only looking at that government transfers and missing all this other stuff above, how, how much we would be missing. Um, but that's another, another great one. Unfortunately, it was 2016. We've got 2021 estimates. Uh, you guys know that COVID uh, made uh, spending on, um, across categories higher. We're just taking a look at, at that data now to understand to what extent. But um, the general gist is that um, you know, 2018 and 2019 were pre-pandemic numbers. So keep that in mind as well. And then we've got some of our information as well that we were able to uh, layer into the analysis just to, to get a, a better flavor for uh, what the organization's services uh, were that they reported on their, on their websites, for example. Okay, next one. Okay, so what we were able to um, estimate thus far, right, and it's always a, it's always a, 
moving target. But what we knew is in that 2018-2019, um, and uh, relatively similar numbers in both of those years, we're looking at about $5 billion per year that we were able to, um, to estimate based on these data sets going into the social safety net related activities in Vancouver. So uh, that's what we know uh, so far. I'm gonna tell you also what we, what's m missing and what we underestimated as well so that you can interpret this with, with caution. Next slide. Okay, so the biggest component, um, like I, I said before, um, kind of single biggest component is that 40% that just goes directly into um, end users um, from government sources. So that could be anything from uh, social assistance, pensions, uh, unemployment insurance. The hallmarks of a social safety net are those direct benefits, right? That's what that's what we talk about in, when we compare Canada to other parts of the world, is how uh, comprehensive is, are those benefits? When somebody falls on hardship, does the government step in and support them with these benefits? And we should be, it should be there, right? It should absolutely be a component of our social safety net and uh, um, no, not surprising, um, nothing new there. Um, the, next, uh, the next bucket though are uh, foundations and charities. And then you've got a kind of a smattering of other sources that we were able to locate. What's not in here, though, is a really, really important bucket. And this is a, an unfortunate limitation to um, the CRA data set, is it only includes charities that have a registered charity status. And so any nonprofit uh, that, that might exist doesn't necessarily have a charitable status, so a, a nonprofit doesn't necessarily show up in the charity's data set, and that's a huge limitation. We know that that's a big limitation. Um, but um, with that being said, we, we know we're capturing, capturing some, but not all. We grabbed a couple nonprofits from some of the federal grants and provincial grants, but we know those, those just happen to be the nonprofits that received grants those years. So we don't know um, in Vancouver that anything that's a nonprofit systematically, haven't been able to capture uh, nonprofits um, that are doing work in this area that may not be charitable revenues. And we just need to acknowledge that this is a, a big missing component and is gonna you know, um, continue to, to make this number not as, not as accurate as it should be. Okay, um, next one. Okay, um, we also uh, wanted to obviously include the VPD component. Lots of our crisis response systems are, that are delivered um, through um, obviously policing, fire, transit safety, et cetera, protective services by law. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have covered this before, but a lot of them also provide social responses as well. So um, we see this mobilization all the time as um, fire or EMS ambulatory care is brought in for not just medical, but also for social or mental health addictions challenges as well, um, overdose responses. So um, it's important to, to include when we talk about community safety and well-being, safety is a, you know, it's a, it's an important uh, component of our social safety net, and so uh, that's why we've obviously included the Vancouver um, Department expenditure as well. In other communities, uh, we were some of these were um, crisis responses were done in collaboration with uh, uh, fire and ambulatory care um, or EMS, and so um, there's lots of communities across the country that are doing that collaboration differently with the social sector as well, where you have um, you have these integrated crisis response teams uh, that uh, recognize how integrated uh, protective and, and social supports need to be. Next slide, please. All right, charitable funding. Um, so in 2018, and, uh, and again, by all means, uh, uh, you can peruse the most recent, I think we've got 2020 data now in, up on the CRA website. Um, but in Vancouver, uh, in the catchment area of Vancouver, there's 2,600 um, registered charities in, that were there in 2018 when we pulled this data for this report, and they uh, registered a total of $14 billion that year. Now, um, again, a limitation to that is it doesn't include the assets that those organizations hold. So we don't know, um, we don't, I mean, we could know, but in this particular analysis, we didn't um, 
analyze the assets. So for instance, if they uh, owned property or had an endowment fund, uh, we just looked at revenues in this analysis. So that's the 14 billion. Now, not every single charity is relevant to this conversation, right? So uh, what we try to then do is dig deeper into that and start to kind of tease out, okay, well, is this charity relevant to this analysis? Is why should we be including this and not this charity? That's a really, really, really tough thing to do, especially when you're working like us across the country where you need to have a consistent methodology. So that's another consideration here. Um, but just to give you an idea on the sources of uh, funding for the charities, which are, are, I always think is super, super important, is uh, provincial government is a huge, huge contributor to this, as you can see, uh, not surprising. Uh, federal government, and then to a lesser extent, municipal government. The other uh, bucket is uh, philanthropy directly. Um, charities might do their own fundraising. They have events. Some of them have some social enterprise work that, that they do. So um, we bucket that, that in, in other, but uh, CRA actually breaks down everything quite, uh, quite uh, um, in a detailed fashion. <laughs> Let's put it that way. All right, so uh, again, a reminder that this doesn't account for the COVID funding that happened after um, this analysis that we took on. Next one, okay. Um, community social service charitable uh, funding. So um, what we then wanted to do, like I said to you uh, before, is let's try to tease out of that 14 billion, what are the ones that are doing really, really relevant work? Because if you recall, phase two is actually engaging with the ones that are um, doing this work in, in depth and um, going deeper with them. So we need to create a, a list of these organizations and, and understand their, you know, their size, their revenues, their expenditures, et cetera, their funders to understand the ecosystem. So um, you can see there um, some of the, the ones that, um, that are in this deeper bucket that are closer to what we're looking for, so uh, community and social service charities. Um, again, the, the best thing to do from here is actually to, you know, um, engage them in, in a self-identification process, which uh, we're, we do in other communities as well as part of this work. Uh, when we look deeper at their revenue sources, pretty consistent. So again, we see the provincial um, government, the federal government, municipal, and then this philanthropic mix. So uh, pretty consistent. We can see a little, some changes over time as well between 2018 and 19. Obviously, I would love, love to uh, update this with uh, 2020 and, uh, and 2021 as well because we need to understand the impacts of, of COVID. Uh, next one. All right. Uh, mental health and addictions charitable funding. So revenues in the mental health addictions charities um, more specifically. So um, again, this... Uh, I'm sorry about the caveats, <laughs> doesn't, doesn't include the COVID uh, work because it was outside of the scope of, of analysis as well. Um, and again, these are organizations that uh, self-identify to the CRA as doing something in the mental health addictions space. Uh, next one. All right. Um, in the same breadth, uh, we also took on some initial systems mapping of uh, the Vancouver um, landscape of social supports. So this is where we we say, okay, that's, that's interesting. Here's a financial, financial data, that's awesome. But now let's see what the, what the kind of public sees when they open up the internet and look for social supports. So um, through one of our um, technologies, we can actually start to mine uh, the, um, the internet, the unstructured data that comes from, from websites and start to analyze you know, organizations and services and programs that are delivering uh, social safety net related activities. Mm -hmm. And so you can, you can see there, this is a, the initial uh, data set that we pulled. Again, this is a couple years old now, but you can see um, the basic needs, the health, emergency disaster, families and parenting, just to give you an idea of, of what's available and also gives you an idea um, of the value of having a consistent data set when you can start to look across jurisdictions as well. All right, I'm sorry if I'm boring you. I, I was told this was a technical briefing, so I'm being technical. Okay, um, so key findings. Um, we do have a lot more mapping that's uh, currently happening across the country. I'm just giving you a glimpse of this. This gets better and better all the time. Part of our work at Help Seeker is to map as much of Canada's social safety net as possible. 
Uh, the social safety net changes all the time, though. So you have to have a mechanism that's constantly drawing this data in and makes, uh, tries to make sense of it and makes it better and better all the time. And of course, uh, as you all know, just because it's on the website doesn't mean it's accurate. <laughs> so um, this is, again, same as the financial analysis. Do step one and then go d deeper uh, by um, deploying some of these deeper analysis tools directly with the organizations and the clients as a, as a phase two. So hopefully we get to do that in Vancouver as well. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is one that's, I think, um, a really important slide. It's a really important one. These are uh, Vancouver Charitable Funding um, organizations, and, and you can see their, um, their revenue in total. And these categories that you see on the left-hand side, this is their self-described uh, categorization to the Canada Revenue Agency. So when an organization files um, their income tax um, to maintain their charitable status, they have to select who do you serve, what do you do, right? They have to kind of click on a bunch of categories. So these categories is what they click on. And so you can see there, um, by far, out of that 1.4 billion of charitable revenues um, that are working in this kind of complex social needs area, um, majority of them are reporting uh, through the CRA relief of poverty. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. Uh, the next most common one is uh, community resources. We've got youth programs, low cost housing, um, and so on it goes. Um, what's interesting is what doesn't show up here is, is the, important thing, the important stuff, things like indigenous um, led organizations or indigenous supports. Um, what else is not on here, right? And is there, are there things that are happening within the relief of poverty that we just, it's too big of a category, we need to dig deeper. So the point with this slide is, okay, that's interesting, we're relieving poverty, but what does that actually mean in practice? And that's why we need to do that deeper next step, is to actually understand the service elements specifically being delivered at that frontline level. Next slide. So considerations from us to uh, from us to the VPD as they were um, thinking about how they might um, help the community move forward. Um, so this enhanced coordination of services, I mean, we're gonna be broken records and, and reaffirm this piece. Data-driven approaches, uh, despite these limitations, you don't sit on data and not use it. If you're collecting the data, we have a responsibility to actually start, start using it and, and look at performance, look at equity, uh, look at effectiveness in relation to um, service uh, capacity and demand, and uh, the social safety in, in general as well. Community engagement and collaboration, I, I mentioned that um, this is phase one of, uh, of two phases of work, so that next step is, okay, we've got a starting spot here, we can have a conversation, um, but let's dig deeper and, and understand exactly what the services are that are being delivered to clients and what the gaps um, are and how we might calibrate the two. And then measurement and accountability. Um, so as a, as a person that's um, been in this system from, you know, basically from, almost from birth, um, I can't tell you how important uh, mutual accountability is. So um, that's the only way we're gonna be tackling these in inequities over time is that, um, is through transparency. And, and hopefully this is a, a small step. Um, I know, I acknowledge it's a disruptive step, um, but it's, a, it's an important uh, first step towards that conversation. I think that's me. Um, there's a couple more analyses to, to do. Um, we did uh, mention that there's um, additional phases of this work that we might undertake as a community. Ultimately, though, none of this stuff is gonna work if the community doesn't come together, right? Because it requires all of us to put our data on the table and uh, you know, park our organizational hats at the door to have a, a conversation about what we need as a community. So. Um, with that, I think I will, uh, I think that's it for me. I think I've said enough for now, but I'm, I'm happy to pass it back to, um, to you, Eugene, if you wanted to say something about your guys' report. Okay. Hi, everyone. So just to give you a bit of a timeline of how this progressed, uh, VPD reached out to HelpSeeker and um, 
we commissioned them to do the study in August of 2021. Uh, in November 2021, HelpSeeker produced their initial draft of their report, and they delivered to us in March 2022 the final version. From that report, there were significant uh, data sets and uh, pieces of information, starting points, also known as recommendations, that we found really interesting. So what we did was we produced an internal report. Uh, it was confidential, it was confidential up to this time um, and still remains so. Uh, and it was, it was entitled Rebuilding the Broken. And basically we wanted to put some context into some of the um, data that was produced, some of the financial statements um, that was produced in the Help Seeker Social Impact Audit. Um, one of the other reasons, and the, the reason why we did the, um, uh, our own internal report, it's listed in our, uh, the copy that you have, but one of the important things was our frontline members are seeing the effects of these complex social issues. They're dealing with it every day. Um, our members who have to deal with that person who has mental health issues um, and is, we're constantly going to calls to deal with them, taking them to the hospital only to see them out on the street or at another call a day later and sometimes multiple times, we know right there that there's a gap in the system, that this person isn't receiving the assistance that they need. They don't, they're not receiving the support that they need. So from that, we wanted to make sure that um, our report outlined these issues because as Alina uh, Dr. Turner mentioned, one of the key things that we wanted to emphasize was the coordination aspect. Um, we feel that these gaps need to be coordinated at all, like they need to be addressed at all levels, and that starts with coordination. So when we're talking about um, coordination at all levels, when our frontline officer is dealing with someone who's substance addicted and they're telling our officer, you know, I really want to get into a treatment program and we're trying to help them get there. They're telling us it's really hard to navigate the system. There are a lot of things that we can't, there's a lot of delays, programs aren't available. So right there, that coordination piece at a community level is missing. And that works its way all the way up. You have a myriad of ministries that are, that are trying to help we're just not coordinating, and because of that, we're not being effective. So that's the other reason that uh, uh, we had uh, the internal report done. We're in the midst of our community consultation process because we felt that in order for us to uh, follow through with the next steps, we needed to reach out to community to get their input and feedback, not only on the Help Seeker report, but also on some of the issues that we were trying to raise. Um, we also came up with several calls to action that um, uh, will be addressed a little bit later. But in our report, we reached out to approximately 10, over 30 organizations and um, 80 individuals were contacted. So we're still in that process. We're still in the process of reaching out. And um, unfortunately, with the release of the, uh, the report to the media, we just wanted to make sure that uh, the context was there for why we did the report as well as the accuracy. And that's, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for either uh, Staff Sergeant Lum or Dr. Turner? And if you could just state who your uh, question is addressed to. Uh, go ahead, Joel. You want to go first? No, no, no. Sorry. I was just making sure. Okay. Jen? Um, yeah, I think my question is for Alina. Um, uh, so some people have been pointing out that your report included $2 billion of direct transfers, like things mm -hmm. like social assistance, yeah. you know, income basically that people need to survive. Yeah. Um, that's not very high at all. So when you put it all together in this big number and then the police are saying like, whoa, look at this big number, surely some like bad things must be happening. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you could never, are you suggesting that we need to reform that that system and maybe take money away from people? Like what is the purpose of putting putting that two billion in there? 
So uh, the purpose is to understand the social safety net, right? So you want to understand um, whether it's adequate or not. Um, if if the community of Vancouver uh, feels that they're they're getting their best value and that's that's the best we can do for um, vulnerable citizens, then by all means ignore that. Um, I don't think we are, right? I think uh, the way we're keeping people in, in poverty with these low rates is completely inadequate. Um, so if we have to rejig, for instance, but this is not my conversation to have, this is your guys' conversation to have, um, but you might say, is does it make sense to have um, this split between direct to end user, right? So um, basic income, for instance, comes to mind for that. Uh, might there be a better way to support these individuals um, other than kind of keeping them in poverty with these um, low incomes? Might we actually recalibrate uh, out of that five billion to say, hey, do we, do we need X uh, amount of programs that nobody's using? Maybe there's a better way to actually up those incomes so that people can have a livable, um, livable um, income. So it's a, it's a question of how do we want to, we're spending this money right now. Is this, the, is this how we want to spend this money? Um, I mean, I, I come from a family that you know, was refugees. I lost my brother in, um, in East Hastings two years ago. So um, by all means, it's not, a, it's not a dig at poverty. It's, if anything, it's a, is this really the best we can do? Well, governments, governments and nonprofits are arguing that by adding this $2 billion figure, right, old age security, mm -hmm. Canada pension plan, that it's misleading. Like, look at the cover of the report that you, that's at the front here. We're talking about Vancouver's social safety net. And it's a picture of the downtown east side. So this, when you're when you're mentioning this two billion dollars, that it's misleading when you look at the issues of homelessness, of the opioid crisis, of crime, mental health issues. So, is it really relevant? How we uh, treat our most vulnerable and the types of transfers we're making to uh, to them, I think is absolutely relevant and should be considered. So is that, is, is it an adequate amount of transfers? Is the direct government transfer adequate or is it keeping people um, in poverty? Right, but this captures, this $2 billion would capture someone who's living in a $10 million house that's getting, that's getting old age security or getting CPP. Mm -hmm. So how is that relevant? It, the social safety net inc doesn't include just people that are the most vulnerable, right? We have to think about our folks that are, um, right, are actually living in, in parts of Vancouver that are not in East Hastings. We have to think about experiences that are not just um, the ones that we always report on as well, right? So we need to think about poverty, um, social exclusion, much more than, um, than what comes to mind when you think about uh, Vancouver um, and Hastings, right? There's there's much much more um, out there when it comes to social needs, and if you, if we miss that, we're missing the big picture again because our response is going to keep repeating or keep focusing on a one um, one really really complex and and rightly acute situation, but this this situation is uh, is a symptom of a much bigger structural decay in our social safety net. And that comes from how we structure our low income and our poverty reduction programming to ensure that these things get prevented from the get-go, right? So mental health prevention, um, all of the work that, that could be done uh, with youth um, as well. So if you look at the first experience of homelessness, it's actually in our, in our early years as youth. Well, if, we're, if we don't talk about uh, um, low income and social assistance, and we don't talk about the, the mom with the kid or the senior that's in, in, a, in living in poverty or only gets um, CPP as their only source of income, then how are we going to prevent what's happening here in the next generation? Right? So we can all agree we need to move upstream. Well, that means we need to look at all the data and analyze what's happening upstream currently and what's not working confused about why you've included what appears to be the entire Vancouver police budget from 2019 in this report. 
How is giving out traffic tickets, for instance, part of the social safety net? I, I just don't quite understand. Just that. to add to that as well, Vancouver Fire's budget, why, why is that included in there? This seems to be conflating a whole lot of things under social safety net. We're talking about pensions and, and fire suppression. Like, how, how do you include all these things in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a, the first blush, right? Uh, first cut of the analysis, released to media. Da, da, da. Usually we do a bunch of work with the community to actually go through this stuff in more detail. Um, what we do with fire in other communities is we actually go and uh, figure out which components of their, of their budgets are to do with social issues more specifically, right? And it's the same with the VPD. So how many percent of your calls are social disorder calls? Um, do you have specific teams that are um, dedicated to mental health and addictions, for instance? Do you have a PAC team? Uh, same as FIRE. FIRE um, in some cities has programming that's specific to um, social issues, so abandoned buildings um, that are derelict and, and become encampments, for, for instance. So the step of stepwise, because same thing with the, you could say this, this uh, argument about any of this or these organizations, because all we know is that they're getting money, um, right? So any of the organizations in the charitable sector that self-identified as relieving poverty, well, what does that mean, right? So same, same argument there. We need to dig deeper to actually understand what is being serviced, what is being provided as a resource and as a service in that case. But again, it's, you have to keep it in context that this is the first step. It wasn't meant to be a... Having here um, the St. George's School Foundation, this is one of the most exclusive private school in the country, and that foundation, I just looked it up, they definitely, you know, the money goes back to supporting the school, it doesn't go out into the wider community. So is, your, is this not an accurate number, perhaps? So which foundation, sorry? Uh, the St. George's School Foundation. And can you, can you see what table that came out of? Because we have, back. I don't know. Maybe this isn't included in your analysis. Maybe exactly. It's just a list of it is. That's right. There's some appendices that are just uh, the VPD asked us to pull. Can you just give me the top ten foundations? Mm -hmm. Here's the top ten foundations. Okay, so, those aren't actually so you, yeah, you need to actually take a look at the methodology to make sure they're included. Now, if there's things that where they said they relieve poverty, and you're telling me actually that's an exclusive school, and okay, we should. I mean, it's not up to me to talk to them about their CRA classification. That's, that, I'm, I'm not the decision okay, maker on that. Was this pulled into your, to the number or not? That I'm saying it depends on the appendix that okay. you're, there's a one table that pulls into the number, but the other ones are just top tens. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're happy to do that. Sure. In the interest of transparency, how much did the VPD pay you to, to do this report for them? Uh, one hundred and forty-two thousand dollars. One hundred forty-two thousand dollars. Yep. And was that taxpayer money? Do you know that went to that? Um, assuming anything that's uh, publicly funded through the, it's I, they don't have any other sources of funding, right? But I'm not here to say that. Yes, so. it was from the VPD budget. Dr. Turner, yep. can you maybe clarify what we're all trying to get at here, I think, is that how much of that $5 billion calcu calculation is related to social services, housing, et cetera, in the downtown east side? So that's a, I mean, we try to narrow in on that. Um, so there are, there is a, a part in the, in the report that goes into um, the organizations that have addresses in, in that postal code. But as, as you heard me say before, do we know that they're only servicing people from that specific area, or do people from other parts of um, of the downtown come there to get service? Vice versa, do downtown east side residents go to other outside of their neighborhood? So it's a there's a number, but there's a billion reasons why it's problematic to uh, to do that because we don't know the client flow within within those. So yeah, so yes, it's. Uh, only possible to some extent. I'd like to ask a question for someone from the VPU, whether it's Staff Sergeant Lum or someone. Um, we're seeing some people, including politicians, making the claim that this $5 billion number and these findings are evidence that money's being wasted in the downtown east side, that's being improperly allocated, that we need more money for police and less money for other services, uh, that, you know, repeating this long standing thing that there needs to be audits and a czar or a commissioner to oversee this funding. Um, I just want to know, how does the VPD feel? Is that a fair conclusion to draw 
from these findings? Is that an unfair conclusion, or would you disagree or caution against that kind of characterization from what we have so far? Because certainly some people are using that and grabbing on the $5 billion number. Some people are saying this is proof of what I always suspected, that money's being wasted, or even worse than being wasted, it's going into corruption or being misappropriated. How do you feel about that characterization? Is that reasonable? Um, I think with that, uh, with that question, um, you know, we're not going to comment on um, what they, they feel about it. I, I think this is the first look at the social safety net in a broad sense. Uh, we realize that there are limitations, but for us, the Help Seeker SIA is a starting point for conversations, conversations at all levels. And these are the things that maybe need to be discussed amongst government, amongst community, amongst organizations in terms of how much money is going where. Starting point for conversations, how does a confidential report start conversations, or was the plan to release it at some point? The plan was to release it at some point, but you're, you're absolutely right. It was confidential, and then it was leaked and brought out to the, uh, to the media. So it forced us to respond because we wanted to be accurate. We wanted to make sure that everything was, uh, uh, provide some context around why we did it. When was the plan to release it publicly if it hadn't been reported in the media? We are still in the process of consultation, so I can't ask, I can't answer that. But what I can say is we, we plan to continue reaching out to community, um, community groups, organizations, government, community individuals, um, to try and get their feedback and input. That's the phase two? That's the phase and two. Help yes. seekers be, has already been retained for phase two? No. Okay. Not as yet. Okay. But how, how comfortable are you starting a conversation with a document that, you know, includes pensions citywide, mm -hmm. but does not seem to include Providence Healthcare, which runs St. Paul's Hospital, and is a huge, like, these numbers, you know, there's too much here, there's not enough there. Like, how comfortable are you standing behind starting a conversation with numbers that don't make a lot of sense lumped in together? Well, I would say that it might not make sense to some people, but I think the methodology that Help Seeker has employed across municipalities, four different municipalities as well as police agencies, has been consistent. Um, it's something that they are able to compare across, uh, across Canada. Uh, they've been retained by, um, I believe it's uh, CMHC to do some work for the federal government. Um, so. We're confident in their methodology. Yes, could we have a deeper look? Absolutely. But at this point, we've got to start somewhere. We can't just keep talking in circles about things that, you know, we need a starting point for information to look at, financial data to start, and then we can start talking about conversations to coordinate services to achieve better outcomes. What kind of a foundation for conversation is it, though, when Caution should be taken when interpreting a neighborhood-based financial, uh, financial analysis for the downtown east side, but then it's also given us 13% of these expenditures. Like, how, how are we having that conversation when we're saying, here's a number, but also don't look at that number because it's not reliable? Well, I don't think that's saying that. I think it's just saying take caution. This is a starting point, right? So we're, we can still get more information. We can still reach out to the community to uh, see if they want to participate in, in further conversations about that. So in Edmonton, we saw the Edmonton police um, use a very similar report by the same company um, use, and use that report as an argument to kind of safeguard their budget. And I see the Vancouver police doing the same thing, frankly, here. So is this just, you know, is this just a PR exercise to, to argue that you need to keep either getting more money or keep the money you have in the city budget? No. Can you, can you tell me more about that? Like that, because you do say in the report, you talk about your own budget, you talk about how, yes. you know, the narrative should, you know, around it is, is wrong, that a lot of other um, organizations get a lot more money. So mm -hmm. how is it not just about the budget then? Well, I think if you look at the Help Seeker report and some of the things that they look at, they're looking at, a, at, at the social safety net from a, from a bigger picture. And some of their starting points measurement and accountability, enhanced coordination of services, effective partnerships, um, collaboration with community, all those things are just as important as budgets. All those things are going to lead toward better outcomes, not just budgets. So if you look at when we started this process back in August 2021, um, 
it's been a long process. It's been a thorough and involved, rigorous process. And as I said, we're, we're still in the middle of consultation. It's just this got out and we wanted to address it. Our report got out and we wanted to address it. All your messaging it. in these materials, like these <laughs> infographics that you put out, all of your messaging is, look at this enormous number. It's, you know, this times as much as the ferry budget. It's, you know, you're so, sort of indicating that it's this horrific number, that there's something wrong with it. I would disagree with that. I think we point out multiple issues. We, we're talking about mental health issues. We talk about the opioid crisis. We talk about um, the need for a better community and individual outcomes. So it's not just talking about the $5 billion figure. But we all know those things. We, like, and the police have done reports before. So, you know, and in, the, in the, the document, one of the documents, you're talking about the fact that for every dollar the police gets, the social safety net's getting 15. So is the motivation to get more money for police? No. So what's the point? The point is to provide context for the figures. Um, we have some examples further on in the, uh, in the document that outline not just the police budget, but other, the total budget, as well as um, some of the other numbers that were significant to us in terms of what we need to look at, things we need to consider in order to make the, um, the outcomes better. I think what's still throwing a lot of people for a loop is the fact that it was the VPD that commissioned this report. And it wasn't something that was done through the city, through the province. Um, so can you further clarify why it's beneficial for the VPD to be the ones paying for this report? It's so sorry, I'm oh, going to... So we're going to we're going to keep all questions for this technical briefing about the technical portion of it the data. There will be an opportunity um, at the end of the press conference, the official news conference that we'll be hosting that you can ask those uh, specific questions and and ask um, you know officials from the VPD those questions. Are there any more technical questions about I'll, I'll get a question in just in terms of Sorry, we're going we're gonna to hang, hang on to the phone lines for a sec. We also have people on the phone, so if we can maybe move to the phone lines, and again, there will be uh, opportunity to ask questions um, after Dr. Alina Turner is staying, and there will be officials from VPD. So those on the phone, you can press star one to be placed in the queue. Oh, was it? I'm so sorry. Sorry, Jesse. <laughs> I'm getting confused. A point of clarification, so the St. George's School Foundation, and you can see that in the appendices in Table A3, that's categorized as foundations advancing education, which are not included as a $5 billion total. So that whole page is just referencing top 10 foundations. Do, do you mind if I just get a question in related to uh, the authors of the report? So who specifically are the chief authors of this report, and, uh, and what are their uh, backgrounds academically or their qualifications? That would be me. Okay. And my background is on, online. Could you just, um, the microphone? So that, that would be me. I would be the, the kind of chief author on it, and you can take a look at my credentials online. Um, okay. you, would you mind just going through just oh, the yeah, basics sure. in terms sure. of what, like, what's your area of expertise? Um, home, yeah, sorry. Um, homelessness and, um, and systems planning is my area of expertise. Um, 20 years in the homeless serving sector. Um, implemented Calgary's first homeless management information system, developed a housing first system of care in Calgary, um, consulted um, across the country for uh, various systems and governments and community-based groups, and uh, fellow at the School of Public Policy at University of Calgary, PhD in housing and homelessness at uh, U of C. Thanks. Dr. Taylor, you mentioned in your remarks that the report shows kind of a misalignment. There's some areas where there's massive gaps, treatment, rehab, there's some areas where there's overabundance of some resources that are underutilized. What are the areas where there's an overabundance of resources that you've identified? In this? Oh, that was a, a general remark about what we're seeing uh, in Canada as a whole. So um, we haven't done that level of analysis. It's a phase two type of thing. Okay, so you haven't, yeah. you haven't identified areas where no. there's overabundance no. in Vancouver? No. Nationally, can, though, what yeah. are the areas where there's overabundance in yeah. social, social safety net resources? Well, I'll give you a, a, an example from my hometown, Calgary. Um, we did an analysis on the mental health ecosystem there and looked at referral networks and um, saw that there's, um, for the exact same service, uh, which was therapy and counseling, 
um, in one part of the ecosystem there was 300 day wait list and in another organization offering the exact same thing there was a zero day wait list so it's a uh, it's stuff like that where you're like well could we just not could we make a referral over there cuz these guys are waiting 300 days so that's what i meant about misalignment so when you have transparency around that you can better get people help quicker yeah, we don't know that we don't know that yet cuz we have that's a phase 2 yeah <laughs> Sorry. And so can you just clarify Providence Health, was that omitted intentionally or can you just explain why that Yeah, I'll tell you about that. So um, the budgets for health are in tremendous, right? They're, they're massive and it doesn't, CRA doesn't give us a breakdown on, on who does what within that budget. So all we know is this uh, charitable foundation that is Providence is receiving X amount of money. So that would have made the number massive, massive, massive because health budgets are really significant. So what we did is actually went to the Kaihai data set that I mentioned before and said, okay, what was publicly reported as mental health and addictions to, uh, to Kaihai? And then that's where we can get the Providence, but there's also other, um, other health organizations, health um, entities, so that we, wouldn't, we were trying to like not have such a big number um, and to narrow in on the mental health and addictions ones. So we got that number through the Kaihai data set. I'm just wondering then, like with all these gaps, and you're saying that, you know, like there, because like I can see, like, and, and from my own experience trying to get data from these governments, it's very difficult. Yeah. Have you warned the VPD who hired you that how that the utility of these numbers may not be great? And, and yeah. you know, like. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. What, absolutely. What was your caution like? I mean, what was that discussion like? It's exactly the same questions that we gave you guys today, right? So we, we go through the, the pros and cons. The data is only so good as good as we can get our hands on. Um, there's been other um, kind of examples um, where folks have said, well, can't you just FOIP um, government to get some of this data? And, and I think you can probably tell me more than I can tell you about how long that takes as well. Um, so we said, hey, let's first blush, let's just see what we can get our hands on right away. Let's see how far we get to it, and then we can make a decision. You know, sometimes it's a, it's an invitation to to governments to participate and say, look, this is what we were able to get. Um, would you like to contribute your data set to this? Same thing with other organizations to say, would it, would you see value in making this better? Right. This is something that just should live in the community long term. And I mean, I appreciate it's it's an awkward thing for the police to start it, but somebody's got to start it. Have to start the conversation, and um, let's see where you, let's see where Vancouver takes it. What and we, had you had you asked Atira PHS, like the top three social housing providers, Atira PHS, Rain City, have you asked them yet in phase one um, to open their books for you? If you have any questions about how they're spending their money? No, this was the phase one was just the financial okay. stuff that I showed to you guys. The community consultation. W is in the, the phase two component. And it wouldn't just be those three, right? It would be all of these. Um, and what else are we missing? Because the other pieces that we don't know is any civil society organizations that are not even registered, like informal networks of people helping each other, or um, like I mentioned before, the nonprofits. We, we missed a whole bunch of stuff um, that we need the kind of crowdsourcing to help us complement. But then this gives us a starting spot to say, hey, we're doing this, do you want to participate? Did we get this right? Did we get this wrong? There's always more, right, be behind these numbers, so we need that context. But imagine fanning this out, and we, we've done this in, in smaller communities, and I, I'd love to do this in Vancouver, but we, can, we get the frontline uh, service providers engaged, we get the clients engaged, and we map the system together, right? So we, and we start with this as a base and kind of fan out the, the questions to mine the hive brain of the community to understand what's really going on. And then you can layer that data to say, well, from a client perspective, this is who provides me with this. But from a service provider perspective, this is what that lens looks like. And you can start seeing the, um, the different perspectives and where some of these opportunities might be. Do you expect that um, All right. once so you get to it? Clarify, uh, sorry, the only individual analysis we did of individual organizations was expenditures and revenues for charitable, and that's all publicly accessible. So we, we didn't contact any organizations, and that's the only analysis you'll see from that um, from us from the individual organizations. Given just uh, you know how how much is missing here, and you're acknowledging the yeah. various gaps that exist. And the numbers we do have, 
seem to be so muddled in terms of various uh, money being included here that's not relevant to really what we're talking about. Given all of those factors, there are going to be some people that say this report is so vague and so muddled that it adds no value at all. What would you say to people who, who will pose that question? I know it is going to come. Oh, totally. I would say make it better, right? Absolutely. Let's go. I make mean, what better? Make, make this analysis better, right? What, what should this analysis be? Let's, let's go. Like, we need to know this stuff. Which bodies specifically? Like, your organization was hired to do the analysis, so which organizations need to give you the information needed? And is your organization the, the best organization to, to do something like this in terms of analyzing this issue? Mm -hmm. I mean, who is the best position to, to do this? Whose position in Vancouver to do systems planning work? That's a, that's a really good question. And that, that's not, it's not my community to answer that for. But there should be um, the infrastructure in place to do systems planning so that we can have this type of analysis and we can all feel confident about, right? So, yeah. How likely will it be that once you get into phase two, we're going to see, you know, you're going through the police budget, you're going through fire rescue services budget, you're going to go through the um, government federal transfers, that we're going to see this $5 billion actually shrink? I don't know if I can make a prediction on where that's going to go. I think, you're, I think what we'll see, though, is we'll see um, different bubbles emerge to say, here's direct transfers to at-risk populations. Here's bubbles that are for deeply complex social needs. We don't know right now. So you can have an organization that actually does all levels of acuity of care, but we don't know to what percentage um, the revenues are allocated. So you know, do is a is one organization's budget primarily for the kind of primary preventative care for at-risk youth, or and 10% goes to complex needs. If we have that type of data, though, you, we can start saying that because then we can see we have a massive gap in specifically complex care, mental health addictions and treatment. Sorry. Um, that's what we're trying to get to is a really precise supply-demand gap. Um, but, I mean, we can't, we, we're not going to get there on, until we start digging into this stuff is, is the point. And sorry, Jesse, you were going to jump in. Yeah, as far as which organization should and shouldn't be included, a part of it comes down to system and clinics. So whether you think an organization that provides therapeutic support for children with specialties um, for diverse abilities is part of your social safety map, we do from a well-being safety standpoint because of that upstream. If you as a community, in fact, don't feel that's a valuable thing to measure as part of your safety, social safety map, then we can start to move organizations in or out. But, uh, that individual should this be in there or not? I think this is the point of the broader exercise. Just to clarify, phase two you mentioned, so the 142,000 was to produce this report. Mm -hmm. So you're retained to do a, another, like a phase two of this report, or what's that hasn't been discussed? We were, we said we would we would take on this analysis, gather the data sets. There's a bunch of you know the actual data work behind the report. Um, to get to this phase, and we've always said there has to be that next, the, the next component. But I mean, we we also know that when this type of stuff starts to emerge, sometimes the technology company is not the best position to do that consultation. So that's really up to to the community to figure out. Staff Sergeant Worm, just to understand, is this the extent of this report? I heard you mention consultation. It's just a snapshot of what the VPD is doing, we can expect a bigger, more comprehensive report? Yeah, it's possible that it could be longer or more, more in depth. It just depends on the consultation process and how that goes. That's happening now, the consultation? Yes. That's how it got leaked. Oh. Yeah. In, ter in terms of the, the report itself, what's the timeline here? Like how, how long did it take to actually do this research and put this together? Uh, as I mentioned uh, in the timeline, I think it was uh, June, let me see, was it July 2021? August, August, sorry, August 2022, where we had the first draft, and that's when we began the community consultation process. So it's only been three months, um, and we're still ongoing. We're still reaching out. Obviously, um, I'd love to give you a final time, but it could be weeks, it could be months. We don't know at this point. 
Um, Dr. Turner, are you work, have you, aside from Edmonton and Vancouver, have you created any similar reports for other police agencies, or are you in the process of doing reports? Lots of our, our reports actually um, are done with municipalities. Municipal governments um, tend to be the our most um, kind of most common clients. Yeah. Police agencies engage you directly and independently, as happened in this case. Has that happened before? Uh, yeah, it's happened. Like Edmonton's a as an example. Um, yeah, yeah. The they were directed by city council, though. Is this as a police agency independently? In initiated such a thing in the um, past? Yeah, we've, we've had that. Yeah. yeah, we've had that. We've also had uh, nonprofits or charity uh, charity groups uh, take this on. Can you outline which police agencies? Um, some of them, it's kind of like Vancouver where we can't say, um, but um, Edmonton's one that's that's mm -hmm. been public for sure. Um, there's also, like you can just give it a, a Google as well for the municipal ones. The municipal ones don't get as much attention, so I don't, I don't know why. I mean, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think it gets attention because there are people, there are advocates, community advocates who have been pushing back against police, you know, what they maybe see as an over, as police going into the social service mm -hmm. kind of arena, and that might be why mm -hmm. it's controversial. Um, what's, what's your sense? Why is it valuable for your company to do these kind of reports mm -hmm. for police? Mm -hmm. Um, well, why it's valuable for us to do them for anybody, <laughs> honestly, like we'll, we'll work with, uh, we've done this work with provincial governments, uh, we did, we've done some of this work with human trafficking, for instance, in Alberta, um, mental health and addictions. It's, you can't, you know, you can't make a statement about what, what you need um, if you don't understand what you have. And you can't, um, you can't take a really solid step forward if, uh, if you don't have all the, all the facts. As, as, as difficult and limited as they are, it's kind of behooves us to use what what's out there, especially this public data. It's it's sitting there for us to uh, to use and leverage in our in our decision making. So um, yeah, that's why it's important to us. And we're a data technology social for social impact. Um, we're also okay with being a little bit disruptive, and that's our role in the ecosystem. There's there's lots of consultants that will you know produce reports that might sit on the shelf where we're uh, clearly not those. But when, when you pitch your services, what what do you pitch as the you know ideal outcome? Mm -hmm. Like you know when you see the VPD spend six figures on my work and you should get X out of it. What what should they? What do you think is a measure of your work being impactful and being successful for them? Mm -hmm. I say that um, it'll it'll change the conversation in the community, and hopefully that conversation leads to better coordination, better transparency, um, and ultimately better outcomes, right? Do you see your services best suited, though, to, to be providing that analysis for police agencies, or is it more for municipal governments or provinces? I mean, the provincial expenditures, shouldn't they be the ones looking into this stuff? I, I would love to work with provincial governments, especially because majority of the funds comes directly from provincial governments. Um, it's not always, it's not always um, where there's interest in this type of work. Has the leak impacted um, the report at all or the work you were doing on the report, having to release it early to the public? <laughs> um, well, it, it, it uh, impacted my, my personal well-being <laughs> <So> <laughs> and travel. Um, I mean, I mean, the report, it was the report, right? It's, uh, you can't really make too many changes at this point. Um, but, I mean, yeah, of, I mean, of course it, uh, it changes the... Um, it changes how we position ourselves in, in the world, right? Because it's it's um, has so many legs right now that we can't obviously control the, the narrative of, of what happens. Um, but that's okay. Um, awkward silence, all right? Okay, no, if there's uh, more questions, we'll uh, naturally take a break right now, a little, a few minutes. I know there are people on the phone. Um, but, you know, we're going to ask you to stay in the queue and we'll hold your questions till after the official news conference. All the key players will still be here. So we'll take a, a five, five minute or so break right now.